All right, so we're continuing talking about um, some topics that are found in Chapter 5 of your book. Uh, the Reynolds Transport Theorem and how it applies to reservoirs is just kind of a direct extension of the continuity principles. And so uh, the applicable homework assignment for that, number eight, uh, that's due on Tuesday. And um, so we'll actually get through chapter five and six before the next exam. Um, so the second midterm exam will include the material from chapter four, which was acceleration, Bernoulli's equation, Euler's equation, irrotational flow. Uh, it'll include this continuity stuff from chapter five, and then in chapter six is where we'll be discussing momentum. So we still got a little bit of time uh, until that next exam. Any questions before we move on? All right. Now, we looked at this figure in the last class, and we're talking about the idea of the system and how we track the location of the system over time. That we use control surfaces as the outside boundaries for an enclosed space that's the control volume. And uh, we kind of ran through the idea that the system is a continuously connected network of particles and um, its location can shift over time. And so what this Reynolds transport theorem says is that we can uh, determine what's happening inside of a control volume. So here CV is referring to the accumulation of mass inside of the control volume. And what this Reynolds transport theorem says is that you can determine the rate of accumulation over time inside of the control volume by monitoring the flow through the control surfaces. So here CS is referring to control surface. I want to draw your attention to the different ways that the letter V is being used in this equation. Uh, for the control surfaces term, what this is saying is the velocity times the area, so that would give you volumetric flow rate if it was velocity times area, and then multiplying that by density gives you the mass flow rate. And so here the V means velocity. But the V with the line through it, that means volume. And so in the control volume term, this is saying the change in volume with respect to time. And then if you multiply that volumetric change over time by the density, then you have the change in mass with respect to density. So just that note that the V with the line through it means volume, but then without means velocity. So the Reynolds transport theorem, you can think of it as having two terms. A term that relates to storage inside of the control volume and a term that describes the flow through the control surfaces. And uh, these variables mean the same things that they've always meant to us with the exception of the volume and the velocity distinction. Um, and this idea of tracking particles over time um, in some environmental engineering applications is complicated by the fact that inside of a tank there may be a reaction happening. And so the, uh, the mass that you're tracking could be produced inside of a reactor. If it is a biological reaction, for, for instance, and you're tracking the mass of microbial particles, then those microbes are maybe consuming a sugar, for instance. If there was sugar coming in, that's some other kind of mass that's not the mass that you're tracking. And so there can be multiple, excuse me, multiple constituents flowing through this water. It could be a mixture of bacteria, dissolved metals. It could be um, sugar or other food that the bacteria are able to consume that's flowing in. But when you're tracking something, you usually identify which constituent it is that you're keeping track of with this transport theorem. And so what the transport theorem says is that not only is it the flow in and the out and the rate of accumulation that affects the system of particles, but also there could be a reaction term in there. Now, if there's no mass being created or destroyed in the control volume, meaning that you don't have a destruction or a production 
reaction. And so that would be maybe a, uh, a tracer that's conservative and isn't being consumed. Or if, if we're just talking about finished drinking water, for example, then the water that flows into a storage tank uh, and flows out of the storage tank, the difference between the two defines how the liquid level is going to be rising and falling. And it doesn't matter whether there is or isn't any bacterial components in that water. So let's just take the, uh, the case that no mass is being created or destroyed. So the left-hand term of this equation is saying the change of mass that is the system over time. And so uh, the system mass would be increasing if there was a, um, a production reaction in the, in the um, reactor. But if the number of particles is staying the same, then it's really just a, a matter of tracking the flow in and the out through the control surfaces and then the reaction of that to the mass of fluid that's in the control volume. So to, in words, the way that we could interpret this equation is that the change over time of the mass accumulation in the control volume. And so the mass of particles, think about what are the units of density times volume. And so density times volume would give you units of kilograms, for instance. And so then if we take this change of kilograms with respect to time, that would be a rate of change of mass over time. And so the, the m dot variable that we saw in class last time, where it has units of kilograms per second, we're talking about what's the mass rate of accumulation inside of the control volume. And so the way to know what that is, is it is because of the flow of mass through the control surfaces. And so now consider the units inside this one. So we'd have density times velocity. So density would be, for instance, kilograms per cubic meter. And the velocity would be meters per second. And then the area would be meters squared. So combining all of that together, the meters per second and the meters squared, so that's cubic meters per second and then multiplying it by the density, we get mass per time, so kilograms per second. So the units are consistent. Now the reason why this is equal to zero is just the assumption that there's no mass being created or destroyed over time. So all of the mass that flows into the control volume either has to be accumulated there or flow out. So any questions so far? All right, let's pause for a second. The uh, suspense is killing me. All right. Ah, okay. So uh, this reduces down to the change of mass in the control volume. So here on the left-hand side of the equation is the storage term. Remember, in the previous slide, we said that the two main terms of the Reynolds transport theorem is storage and transport. So it's just what is accumulating in the tank and then the part of the equation that says the difference between the flow in and the flow out. So now here on the left hand side this is talking about storage. The change of mass in the control volume with respect to time. Now this is different from the term that was on the left hand side of this earlier version of the Reynolds transport theorem because what this is saying is the mass of system itself so the number of particles that we count as being a part of our system. So it could be the number of bacteria, or it could be the mass of some chemical pollutant, like maybe uh, trichloroethylene or something. So this first term was still taking into account that maybe the system particles are being created or destroyed. But when we say that none of that is happening, that there's no reaction, this MCV is just saying whatever particles we have defined as our system mass, um, they're not changing, but the rate of accumulation in the control volume is the difference between the flow in and the flow out. So the right-hand side is the transport. Storage on the left, transport on the right. 
All right. Now, some of the application of these ideas are that um, the principles that we've learned for Euler's equation and Bernoulli's equation um, are applicable to particles, but you may recall that when we were comparing and contrasting the idea of the Lagrangian approach and the Eulerian approach to flow fields, what we said with the Lagrangian approach was the, uh, the idea there is you're monitoring individual particles. The challenge being that there's so many particles, so many different water molecules, that it's impossible to keep track of all of them over time. So if you wanted to find out what is the pressure at some downstream location, like if that was the question, like you knew the pressure at A, and you want to find out how is the pressure changing at B, because it looks like the pipe is contracting. We have a large diameter with slow velocity, and then the flow is accelerating because of that reduced diameter and higher, ele uh, higher velocity. So the pressure is obviously going to change. Now to find out the pressure at B, you could use Euler's equation. Now think about what Euler's equation was. Euler's equation was for local acceleration. So if you track just one individual particle, that individual particle is experiencing a local acceleration as it goes along this path. Even though we've talked about this as like a convective acceleration example, like if you just look at a single instant in time, the uh, particle is accelerating with respect to position. But one particle that's moving from A to B, it takes a certain period of time to do that, and its velocity has changed during that period. So the individual particle is experiencing a local acceleration, even though the broader context of all of the fluid particles at a, a certain instant is experiencing convective acceleration. So if you wanted to know how the pressure is different at B, what you could do is use Euler's equation, which is for the local acceleration, and just say this little molecule of water, it's being accelerated. And so how does its pressure change because of that acceleration that it experiences? Uh, or you could apply Bernoulli's equation if the flow conditions aren't changing over time between location A to location B. But remember, the Lagrangian approach is just saying that there are so many particles and let's try and keep track of all of them. So it's not practical. Uh, the Eulerian approach that we talked about before was the idea of dividing up the flow field into these little elements and using the characteristics of one fluid particle inside of an element to represent everything that's happening in the element. And so in an environment like that, what you can do is come up with equations that predict the fluid properties at a location by looking at what were the fluid properties one element prior to that. And between, in the difference, uh, the distance between those two locations, applying Euler's equation and Bernoulli's equation, applying the free body approach to all of these elements where we had location A and location B, and so we're saying what forces were applied to each one of these cubes of water. Um, you're, you're tracking the, uh, the pressure of the fluid because the forces that are applied to the fluid um, are what's causing the change in pressure. And so the, uh, the Reynolds transport theorem, remember that fluid properties are transported along with the liquid as it moves. And so the Reynolds transport theorem says that if this is your control volume, each one of these elements is the control volume, then the fluid properties go in and out, and the difference between the two is what's accumulating inside of that element. And so you know, volume can't be accumulating inside of this enclosed element because it's already full of water. And so what has to be transported through there are the fluid properties like the, uh, the momentum of the fluid. So later on, you may someday take a, an elective course that's offered here at Marshall that basically um, introduces students on how to use computerized models to break up a flow environment into these little meshes and it's called CFD, Computational Fluid Dynamics. 
and uh, it's applying computer programs to predict what the pressure change would be and you're able to actually visual visualize where um, turbulence occurs and increase and decrease the flow rate and the way that it operates is just by um, treating each little fluid element as an individual location that external forces are applied to and then looking at how the pressure adjusts because of those external forces. All right, now uh, a little bit more basic than that is the case of liquid accumulating inside of a reservoir. So this example is just to get us some more experience with applying the Reynolds transport theorem. So here is kind of the, the, the version of the Reynolds transport theorem that we could use for some practical problem solving. And so remember the way to interpret this is the accumulation of mass and the control volume over time is the difference between the mass flow rate in and the mass flow rate out. Now let's look at this example in particular. We have a mass flow rate out through the bottom of the tank that is given as three kilograms per second. And we know that the, uh, the stream of water that's coming in, there's a certain location where we have a control surface and the control surface um, bisects this stream of water that's coming in and the cross-sectional area of the water as it passes through the, uh, the control surface is 0 0.0025 meters squared. And we know the velocity of that fluid stream. And since it's water, we know the density is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Now the other thing that this example is saying is the diameter of the circular tank. And so we're looking at a side view of the tank. But if we were to consider it maybe in three dimensions, the tank would look more like this. Okay, and so what this is saying is that the diameter of the tank, the diameter is 0 0.50 meters. Okay, now with the diameter you can find the cross-sectional area, right? What we want to know, is the liquid level going up or is it going down? And then um, what is the liquid level changing with respect to time? So what's the velocity? Like how quickly is it going up or going down? And so the velocity of that will be the net volumetric flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area. So V equals Q divided by area. But that's the net, meaning the difference between the in and the out. So, um, and remember, of course, the mass flow rate, M dot, is the density times Q. All right, so I'm going to pause for a moment, give you some time to calculate what is the mass flow rate in. So find M dot in. Find the difference, and then from that, you'll be able to tell how many kilograms per second of water is either accumulating or net negative accumulation, meaning the liquid level is going down. So find the mass flow rate over time, the, the change in mass flow rate over time, and then from that, you can determine the velocity. Okay, so here on the screen you can see how I've calculated the, the volumetric flow rate in and the mass flow rate in. So the flow rate in, you know, this water is being poured in at a certain point has a given cross section and velocity. So we can just multiply that area and the velocity together and find the volumetric flow rate of that stream that's going into the tank. So 0 0.0175 cubic meters per second. And then multiplying that by the density gives you the mass flow rate. So there's 3 kilograms per second going out and 17.5 kilograms per second coming in. So any questions about this flow rate in part? You'll notice that I also converted the diameter of the tank, so that top diameter, 
to the cross-sectional area. So that's not the area looking at it from the front. That's the area looking at it from the top, top view. So the net accumulation of mass in the tank is 14.5 kilograms per second. So there's more flowing in than is exiting the tank. And that means that the liquid level is going to be rising because there's more mass coming in than is going out. Okay. Now the rate of rise, you know, 14.5 kilograms per second is the same as 0 0.0145 cubic meters per second. So this was mass flow rate known, density known. So I'm finding the Q net accumulation. So the net accumulation of liquid in that tank is 0 0.0145 cubic meters per second. And then the rise velocity of the water is just going to be the volumetric accumulation rate divided by the cross-sectional area. So 0 0.0738 meters per second is how quickly the liquid level is rising. Okay, so any questions about that? I'll pause for a moment in case you're writing down some notes here. Yep. That's right. All right. So we're looking at a reservoir. And water is being pushed into the reservoir with the piston at B. So look at the arrow. The arrow is indicating the direction of the piston. And you can see that the piston has a diameter of 6 centimeters, the piston at B. Whereas the piston at A has a diameter of 3 centimeters. And it's sliding to the left at a rate that's double the piston B. So piston B is moving at some velocity V and then this piston is moving at double that. So the diameter is 3 centimeters on the left, 6 centimeters on the right. Now we don't necessarily have to get our calculators out. We should be able to reason through what's happening to the water level. So there in your notes, I think everybody here is taking notes, I think the three options of what could be happening to the water level is that the water level is going up, it's going down, or it's staying the same. So why don't you write down in your notes. I won't do a show of hands because, you know, that puts people on the spot and they wouldn't feel sure. But like what's happening to the water level? Is it liquid level increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? Now, of course, there's a little bit of a trick to this question. It's a trick question in a sense, simply because sometimes people forget that cross-sectional area is a function of diameter squared. So you know that Q equals VA, right? We already know that Q equals VA. And so this is kind of a trick question because what I've done is I've arranged it to make it look like Q in equals Q out, but not the case. That is not true. Q in does not equal Q out because the diameter at B being six centimeters is going to have four times the, uh, well, it's going to have double the, um, no, four times, four times the cross-sectional area, the, uh, the piston at A because area is pi D squared divided by four. So, this piston, B, has twice as much diameter, but that's going to make it have four times as much cross-sectional area. So in is bigger than out in this case. Even though we've got double the velocity, that's not going to be enough to cause 
the liquid level to go down or stay the same. The liquid level will be rising. So it's kind of just symbolically, what I did here was I solved for the actual areas. And so plugging the numbers into the equations, you can see that the area at B is four times the area at A because of that squaring of the diameters. And so even though the piston A is moving twice as fast, that's no match for the fact that piston B has four times the area. So if we wanted to determine the flow rate in here at location B, it's going to be whatever the velocity is multiplied by the area. So we're just calling the velocity V. So 28.2 V is the flow rate in. The flow rate out, 14.1 V. Because you're multiplying it by 2v because it's twice the velocity, but the area being a quarter means that the flow rate out will be half. So there's a net accumulation. So if we wanted to find the mass flow rate of the accumulation, well, first of all, we'd have to know v in actual numeric terms rather than just as a variable. But whatever the velocity v is, we could use that along with the liquid density to find out what's the rate of accumulation. But it's clear that whatever the fluid is and whatever the magnitude of V is, that in is greater than out. So the liquid level is going to increase. All right. Now, this is a problem that uh, has existed as a homework assignment in past semesters kind of a tricky one, but I've converted it into an example just so that uh, we can talk about it together. Um, what it is, is think about a pipe that is full of a liquid, and it doesn't necessarily say what the, oh, wet water. Okay, so a pipe is full of water, and then a metal cylinder falls through that pipe. And let's just assume that it's falling down through the center of the pipe for simplicity's sake. So we know the diameter of the pipe that's full of water. The diameter is 200 millimeters. We know the diameter of the cylinder. And then we know the rate that that metal cylinder is falling downward, one meter per second. And what this example is asking is, what's the velocity of the water that goes around the side of that falling metal cylinder? So let me just sketch it on the whiteboard here, because I think there's an adjustment to the drawing that I can make to make it uh, more obvious what this problem is asking. So here's our cylinder that's falling downward one centimeter per second, no, one meter per second. One meter per second. And as it falls down, think about what's happening to the water that it pushes out of the way. If we were going to say, Here's a control surface that it's passing through. So I'm just drawing a little dashed line. That's our control surface. And so the, uh, the cylinder goes downward, and it's pushing water out of the way. And the water has to flow around the outside edges of the cylinder to uh, replace the volume that is being opened up as the cylinder falls down. So think about the cylinder's falling down, it's opening up space behind it, and it's encroaching on space in front of it. And so the liquid deforms around that falling cylinder and is pushed around the outside edges. And so what this problem is asking is it's saying, well, let's just assume that the water is coming around the outside edge of it. Let's find the average velocity of that flow. So effectively what we're doing is we are creating a control volume that looks like this shape. And we're keeping track of the flow in and the flow out of that control volume. So here, the, the dashed line is the control surface, the area around that, and then the enclosed area, the, the enclosed volume is the control volume. So the cylinder enters the volume at a certain rate and we've done this before where we calculated a volumetric rate of a solid. And we know when we were talking about buoyancy, um, 
you can have a volumetric flow rate of a liquid or of a solid. And so that cylinder isn't a liquid, but we could still find out the rate that it enters the control volume, and then that's going to be the same rate that the water goes out. So let me draw a top view, just to make it clear what this would look like if we were viewing it from the top. There's going to be the solid cylinder of metal, and then on the outside of that is this water pipe. And so the water pipe has a diameter of 0 0.2 meters. And then the uh, metal cylinder is uh, 0 0.15 meters is the, uh, the diameter of that one. So the water is getting pushed in this ring. It's, it's kind of like a donut, right? So the water that's getting pushed out of the way is going through this section. The water doesn't flow through the cylinder itself, the metal cylinder. You know, that's impervious. But as that falls down, it's pushing the water around the outside edges. And so this is the area that the water's flowing through. So I'm going to pause for a second because what I want you to do is calculate what's the mean velocity of the water that's going around the outside edge of that cylinder. So you're going to have to find the difference of the areas. The overall pipe area minus the area of the cylinder. Too much responsibility. No, he was a really good governor. All right. Um, let's look at this falling cylinder. So what is the velocity of the water that's flowing around the sides? OK. So here's just the same sketch that I put on the whiteboard. And then I've uh, drawn the control surfaces. And so this control surface, in our case, is not moving over time. It's the fixed location. And so think about what's flowing in and what's flowing out. Now this is just a cross-sectional view of the control surfaces. It's actually a three-dimensional shape that goes all the way around that cylinder. So as the cylinder falls downward into the control volume, it pushes water out around the edges. So the flow in, it's the cylinder that's flowing in to the control volume. Even though it's a solid, we could still calculate its effect on the liquid. And we can express the rate that it enters the control, uh, the, um, control volume in volumetric terms. And so we know its velocity. We know the cross-sectional area of the shape that's plunging downward. And so 0 0.01767 cubic meters per second. You know, I'd encourage you, even when you're just doing these example calculations in class, I'd encourage you to take the time and write the units. Uh, I think it's just a great habit to get in, including the units along with your calculations. It, ine it will inevitably help you to avoid mistakes and make what you're calculating more clear to whoever's reviewing your work. So. Um, because this control volume has no capacity for additional storage, you know, it's not like the cylinder can enter the control volume and nothing happens. There's no potential for storage there. So the flow in equals the flow out. So the rate that the cylinder enters the control volume is going to be the same rate that water's pushed through that outside ring. And so the flow rate out is the same, 0 0.0176 cubic meters per second. And then the velocity out will be uh, determined by the, the cross-sectional area, the net area, the difference between the pipe and the, uh, and the cylinder. So here you can see I've calculated the net area. And then finally, the velocity out is the volumetric flow divided by the net area through which the water is flowing. So point 1.29 meters per second. So the cylinder is falling down slower than that. So why is the velocity of the water faster than the velocity of the cylinder? Well, that's because the cylinder has a larger cross-sectional area. 
the area of the cylinder is bigger than the area of the, um, the flow area that the water's going through, the outside edges. Okay. Um, Here's another example of where we can apply the ideas of the continuity principle and Reynolds transport theorem. So we in the lab have already done the orifice equation before where we're able to calculate the velocity of a jet. So water streaming out and the velocity of that can be determined by square root of 2gh. Now from our experiments, you know that there's a kinetic energy correction factor and also there's a, a discharge coefficient to account for energy losses. But this is assuming that there is no energy losses due to turbulence and the approach uh, of the fluid towards the orifice. This velocity equation just assumes no energy loss, maybe because we have that perfectly inviscid fluid. So, uh, in the homework, you have a problem, problem number eight, where I'm asking you to determine what's happening in this system where there's flow in at one location and flow out at two locations. And there's a word in here that's really significant, the word equilibrium. So it says, when equilibrium is reached, so we've got water flowing in and out of a tank, and what does it mean when it says when equilibrium is reached? Flow in equals flow out. That's right. Equilibrium means flow in equals flow out. So what's going to happen to the water level when flow in equals flow out? It's steady. It's not changing. All right, so in this problem, this, the second word here is saying assume that the liquid level is steady is not changing because flow in equals flow out. Okay, so we've, we know the in in mass terms. And just to make things a little tricky, you can see that the units here are hours. So we know how many kilograms per hour is coming in. And by definition, as it's been defined, the flow out is going to be the same as this flow in. But the flow out is going through two locations. It's going through this discharge pipe where we know the, the diameter of the circular pipe and the average velocity of the flow. And then water is also coming out of the orifice. And we know the diameter of the orifice, but the velocity isn't directly given. What you can do is you can use the orifice equation. V is the square root of 2gh to find that velocity. And I'm saying assume that the discharge coefficient is 1.0. So neglect any energy loss effects. So I don't want to give too much more away on this problem. I just wanted to um, let you know that equilibrium was a pretty important word in that problem statement. So with everything that you're given and everything you know, especially with the orifice, orifice equation, you're solving for H. Like how high is the liquid level going to be when it reaches that equilibrium? All right. You know, in some ways, this is like our lab. Because in our lab, we had one flow going in to that cylinder that had the discharge through an orifice. We had one stream in and two streams out. There was the overflow, and then there was also the water that was going out through the orifice. And so here it's a similar thing. One stream in, two streams out. And our, in our experiment, it reached equilibrium, and here it will as well. And so you're solving for H. So there's a, an interesting application of continuity principles that um, comes up in wastewater treatment. One of the interesting things about wastewater treatment is that uh, the vast majority of the pollutant removal is accomplished with, bio, uh, with uh, biological means. So there's microbes that are living here in an aeration tank. Um, this is kind of you know, maybe one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century was um, activated sludge wastewater treatment where what you're doing is you're taking 
you're settling sludge at the bottom of a clarifier and you're recirculating a portion of that sludge to provide hungry bacteria who will break down the pollutants that are in the wastewater. So you have to add a little additional air so that they have oxygen to breathe. But these hungry bacteria get pumped into the aeration basin and they'll consume a lot of the pollutants that's going through the treatment process. Um, but the thing about bacteria is that they, uh, they take a while to get acclimated. That you can't just immediately turn a bacteria on and turn it off like you can turn on and off a pump. So what they like is steady conditions. But um, what you're going to learn a lot about next semester in Civil Engineering 331 is that humans have variable behavior. We don't use water at a steady rate over time, but more typically water use decreases at night and since humans are using less water there's less water going to the wastewater treatment plant at night and then during the daytime hours water consumption goes up and so does the production of wastewater and that's actually not very good for the bacteria that are in these aeration basins they like steady conditions they don't like big swings in their food supply and so one of the things that's sometimes added at wastewater treatment facilities is a flow equalization basin. And what the purpose of that is to do is to kind of smooth out these wide swings over time. Where if you can provide kind of a, a cushion effect or a shock absorber that brings the peaks down so that there's less of a variation between the daytime high and the nighttime low in the flow rate that's coming into the treatment plant, then the... Um, then the bacteria are more efficient and they break down the waste more completely. And so sizing the flow equalization basin, like figuring out how big of a tank you need, is an application of these principles of the Reynolds transport theorem. Because what you're doing is you're calculating the difference between the flow in and the flow out. And so you're looking every hour of the day, is the tank going to be filling? or draining, and so therefore how large would it need to be over the course of a daily cycle when you have the tank filling during the daytime hours when there's too much flow coming in, and then the tank would be draining at night when there's not enough flow coming in. So we'll do some of that next semester in hydraulic engineering. We'll do some sizing of reservoirs, and it's a direct application of these continuity principles. All right, well, that is it for today. Remember that your next assignment is due on Tuesday. And if you have any questions as you're working on that, I'd be happy to help you out. Just uh, stop by my office or give me a call on Teams.